So two videos into this new series of 10 planned videos, I realized I painted myself into a bit of a corner. So here's the problem, I got to the second term and I realized, wait a minute, this isn't a terrible term at all. This is actually a really, really good term. It just gets students into a lot of trouble. And then I realized, wait a minute, trouble starts with a T too. And so I've decided to rebrand the series two episodes in as 10 troublesome terms in chemistry. That makes this probably, you know, 25% less clickbaity and about 50% more honest. And if I'm being honest, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing to the channel. I would be ecstatic if we can get to 4,000 subscribers by the end of this series. So with my next concert shirt donned, and if you know who this is, go ahead and leave a comment below. Uh, let's get started. Term 10 was the misunderstood term suction. Term number nine is the troublesome but terrific term polarity. The troublesome aspect of the term polarity for the first year chemistry student is that it is used in two very subtle but significantly different aspects of chemistry. Now the first way most students run into the term polarity is referring to the polarity of a single chemical bond. By comparing two atoms desire for electrons, which we call electronegativity, we can determine how those electrons are shared within the chemical bond. Now it's extremely easy for a first year chemistry student to classify a single chemical bond. All you do is you look up the electronegativity values and find the difference. And then depending on the difference, you're gonna drop into one of three buckets, nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, or ionic. It's easy to do and students don't really think much about it. You can master it in about eight seconds. But not long after that in chemistry, you're gonna be dealing with finding the polarity of an entire molecule. This is way more complex than finding the polarity of a single bond. Not only do you have to account for the polarity of each chemical bond in that compound, but you also have to account for the 3D geometry, the overall shape of the molecule, to determine whether or not the entire molecule has a symmetric or asymmetric distribution of charge. Determining polarity goes from, you know, really using addition's tricky friend, to like a beautiful mind. Now there are certainly some shortcuts that a first year chemistry student can do, but even then it is really a lot more complex than determining the polarity of a single bond. And the fact that the polarity of a single chemical bond has to be used as part of determining the overall polarity of a molecule only makes it more confusing. This is how weird it can get. You can have a molecule composed of nothing but polar covalent bonds. And yet because of the geometry of the 3D structure, it will have a symmetric overall charge and be a non-polar molecule. And on the flip side, you can have a molecule like ozone, O3. This is composed of true non-polar covalent bonds. I mean, this is as equal of a sharing as it can get. And yet because of its geometry and the placement of some unshared pairs, ozone is considered a polar molecule. It's weird. Now there's no easy way to get around this. You really just have to slow down and pay attention to the idea of the polarity of a single bond versus the much more difficult polarity of an entire molecule. Now there's one thing I can tell you to help out. Watch the terms you use. Don't say nonpolar bond, say nonpolar covalent bond. And don't say polar bond, say polar covalent bond. That simple choice is gonna remind you that you're talking about the polarity of a chemical bond not the polarity of an overall molecule. And I think that'll help you a little bit. Two down, number eight is coming soon. And it's a two for one and definitely troublesome. So until next time, stay out of trouble and have a great day.